Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Alan Don and I, Niels Castro Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules based investor. Alan, great to be back with you this week. How are you doing? And uh, more importantly, has Dublin recovered after St. Patrick's Day? Yeah, we, it has. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty, pretty quiet weekend. Uh, we, we had. Uh, Success in the rugby, that was the main highlight. So we, we, we are the Six Nations champions, uh, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're well uh, back to normal here by now. And and I know you and I spoke actually yesterday and you said that you had snow early in March. That's quite unusual. We did. We had no snow all winter and then on the 1st of March, um, at least a couple of inches fell uh, that morning. And uh, But now today, lovely sunshine here, so it uh, definitely feels like spring is certainly in the air. I can tell you that Switzerland today really feels almost like summer. It is uh, very nice, I have to say. Anyways, we have a few topics that you kindly brought along, so uh, they'll be interesting to dive into. We don't have any questions, um, but as we always do, we start off with hearing a little bit of what's been on your radar uh, recently or since we last spoke, um, what's catching your attention at the moment. Well, it's been a very interesting week. Uh, in the last week, we've had the you know the monumental um, ending of ZERP in Japan, um, which was uh, obviously long heralded, but I suppose it is certainly a, a noteworthy historical event. But then, just as interestingly, uh, in the week where the Bank of Japan raises rates, the Swiss National Bank went and cut rates. So, I mean, uh, and the Fed were, were, were on hold. So, so we had the full spectrum of. of um, of actions from central banks, so I, I think it really does highlight a couple of things. You know, we, we've we've been long talking about the desynchronized cycles, and I think that that's pretty good evidence of it. You know, one central bank easing, another one hiking in the same week. Um, I mean, I saw an interesting chart from 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 Peter Burzen at BCA, who we've had on the Global Macro before, and actually historically, when when Japan has hiked rates, it's tended to be just before. Uh, the global economy has gone into recession. So it, it remains to be seen whether that's a, a good indicator. And, and speaking of indicators, I saw a, an article there just before it came on that uh, two's tens yield curve in the US is inverted for the longest it's ever been inverted, well, at least in, relative to the data uh, that they had. So certainly a lot of interesting stuff going on um, from, from, from a monetary policy perspective and a markets perspective. One other interesting story I, I just picked up on this morning, and it was about uh, in Japan, obviously we've had an, an end of, of zero interest rate policy. And also uh, inflation has, uh, the reason we've had that is because inflation has started to pick up, but also also starting to motivate a change in investor behavior in Japan. And this Bloomberg article was highlighting that there's one quadrillion yen in uh, in bank deposits in in Japan. Now, I had to go and look up what a quadrillion is because <laughs> there's a lot of zeros there. Um, so basically, it's, uh, let me get this, I think it's a thousand billion. Yeah, that's what it is. So that's about, uh, so that's about a seven, seven trillion US dollars equivalent in yen. Um, so the point is that, you know, all joking aside, that's, you know, pretty big number. And if we did start to see, you know, Japanese investors doing something different, you know, uh, that the, 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 the amount of cash they hold is about sixty-two percent of their total assets. So it's very high relative to historic or sorry international norms. So you know potentially that could start going into the stock market, or else you know it could go overseas. You know a lot of people have been expecting a rebound in the yen on the back of you know normalization of interest rate policy in Japan, but there is also now a sense where maybe they're not going to tighten that much, and and that might be it for now. Uh, and we've got this wall of money in Japan. 
okay, maybe it's too aggressive to say that it's going to start moving somewhere, but but at the margin, it does sound like um, that that investors are now changing their mindset given that you've got higher inflation. So I think that's a really interesting story, something to keep an eye on going forward, uh, because as I say, the general sense had been when Japan raises rates, money's going to flow back, but maybe that won't be the case. We'll have to monitor that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll talk a little bit around this uh, in in some ways, maybe when we get uh, sort of to your uh, big macro picture in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, it is interesting, of course. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, Japan has been hiking, and the Swiss National Bank surprised, I think, a lot of people yesterday when they caught. Uh, what's also interesting is that both the yen and the Swiss franc is down one and a half percent, more or less exactly the same in the last week against the dollar. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, outcome. But of course, as you say, um, other things have uh, done well. I mean, European stocks, uh, Japanese stocks, US stocks are all making new all-time highs uh, this week. So um, yes, I mean, 2024 is turning into um, a very interesting year for investors, that's for sure. Now, let's just swiftly move on to something incredibly related to what we've started off talking about. And that's kind of uh, as we normally do when you and I talk. And it's just to talk a little bit about sort of your big picture framework. Obviously, you have the uh, the luxury of talking to some global macro thinkers in between uh, when you do your recordings. Um, and um, I'm sure maybe some of the conversations uh, makes you think about some of these uh, topics in a in a bigger sense. So I'm I'm curious as to where where we're going to go uh, today. Yeah, well I I mean I just wanted to focus in on one element of of what I'm seeing and reading and and hearing and and I, and I and I agree. I mean ever since, you know, we had that pivot from the Fed um at the end of last year and and equities uh, started to move up and uh and we've, you know, I suppose more and more evidence so far. I mean it's, it's a work in progress so of the soft landing. And um, people have been saying, well, you know, what's the historical parallel? And, you know, people like Chen Zhao, who's been on with us uh, from Alpine Macro, have been making the case that actually maybe uh, the parallel is not so much with the 1970s or post-World War II, but it might be the mid-1990s. That could be the, the historical parallel. And the reason for that is obviously that that was the one tightening cycle where the Fed um, did engineer a soft landing. Uh, if you go back to 1994, rates were, uh, you know, raised very aggressively in that year uh, from about, you know, I think it was 3% to about 6% or so, um, maybe five and a half, six. And uh, equities took a bit of a correction, not, I don't think as much as 2022, but it was a tough year for bonds. And then as soon as, the, you know, the, the soft landing was achieved and as soon as uh, the Fed stopped tightening, the equity market took off and bonds recovered. And we started to see that to a, a, to an extent. We've also had a few more parallels. I think we, we obviously pro- productivity growth has been very well has been strong in the last few quarters, having been very weak. And I, be, I mean, I be, people point to AI and say, "Oh yeah, sure, AI, you know, productivity of course is picking up." But I, I'm a bit skeptical as to whether AI has actually contributed to pro- productivity growth yet. But you could you could make that case. So, so certainly there is that that parallel being drawn from some commentators. Like, are we in a scenario? similar to the 1990s or the late 1990s. And I think, yeah, you, you can draw that parallel in terms of the soft landing um, and uh, possibly on the productivity side. Um, I mean, the question then is, is it more like 1995 or 1999? Because obviously other people are saying, well, you know, pointing to, to, to bubbles. And that's, an, that's something I wanted to talk about as well. You know, a lot more talk in markets about bubbles, which kind of surprises me a little bit because, yes, S&P 500, you know, forward PE is high, but 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 not as high as say 2021. So we, we you know we've had more elevated valuations in absolute terms. Maybe in in relative terms, um, it, it might be a different story. But in absolute terms, it's it's not as high. And I mean that whole question around uh, you know are, are we in a bubble? Are valuations high? Got me you know thinking about you know the past and looking back to to what the the period of the 1990s. And of course, people who were in the markets back then will remember Greenspan's famous speech around irrational exuberance, which was in uh, December 1996. So at the time, the Fed was worried about, you know, was was the equity market in a bubble? And, uh, you know, if you read around what the kind of the Fed was debating at the time, there was this debate as to, you know, were valuations too high? 
um, and what should they do about it? So they got like people like Robert Schiller to come in. They they they, they had a meeting of all the, the the good and great on Wall Street around what their views were and valuations. You know, people like Abby Cohen, who was a big cheerleader for the bull market back then. Uh, and, you know, there was no particular consensus reached. Uh, and, and Greenspan wasn't quite sure whether he should be kind of token down the market. And then famously, he made a speech in December 96 where he said, oh, it possibly, he kind of asked the question, was the market subject to irrational exuberance? The market sold off initially, but then absolutely skyrocketed after the fact. Like So that was December 96. In 97, the market was up 31%. In 98, up 27%. And in 99, up 20%. And after he spoke, the market doubled, more than doubled. So it was just, it's interesting. I don't think you could say we're in a bubble at the moment looking at the market as a whole. I mean, certainly valuations are, are expensive relative to history. But, you know, we're not seeing the bubble-like behavior like we saw back then. But certainly the conditions could possibly come into place to, to fuel that kind of book. I'm not, I'm not predicting that, but I'm saying you could, you could conceive of it. Um, and particularly, uh, you know, back in that period, there was that debate about with the central banks being just purely focused on inflation. And if you're going to cut rates because you say, well, inflation allows it, you know, by cutting rates, you could be adding fuel to an equity bubble. So I think that's the scenario that I think about, you know, if we do actually see these rate cuts coming through, even though, infl- you know, even though growth is still fairly solid, uh, just because inflation has come back down, you could have all of this debate uh, revisited again. So what does that mean from a global macro? Per- I, I, look, I mean, I think we're in a holding pattern. You know, the, the, the data is still pretty solid. Lots of people still looking for, um, you know, an eventual softening of, of the data in the labor market, but we're not there yet. And obviously, if you look at the Fed's projections th- this week, they're actually getting more upbeat on economic growth and they're nudging those growth forecasts higher and the rate forecasts higher. So for the moment, you know, Goldilocks is still in play. So unless we see either much stronger growth to take rate cuts totally off the table or much weaker growth, for the moment, uh, you, you know, you, it's hard to stand in the way of the equity market rally. And that's that's what a trend following position is doing for you at the moment. It's just keeping you with the trend for the moment. And it's hard to disagree with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, and I think, I guess, the reason why part of the conversation we, we see nowadays is focused on this, you know, are we in a bubble? I guess you could say that certain things looks like they're a little bit in a bubble uh, when you look around the market. I mean, clearly this AI driven thing is in a bubble and I'm going to I'm gonna get into massive amount of trouble um, uh, when I say this because I really have no idea about individual stocks. But I did pick up someone saying that if you look at NVIDIA has been kind of the poster child for this uh, AI rally, um, I'm pretty sure he said that about 78% of their revenue comes from data centers that they have built out, which has nothing to do with AI. So kind of interesting that that uh, that they are the poster child for AI. Um, but in any event, um, as I said, that's, I'm probably not the best person to to talk about these things. There's a couple of other things. We, we are talking about sort of global macro picture. I was telling you before uh, coming on uh, or for, before we pressed record, a couple of interesting things just happening today, uh, Friday. Um, one is that Putin apparently has come out saying that they're no longer doing a special military operation in Ukraine. They're now at war with, with Ukraine. I think that is an interesting change of language. And I also think from memory, from the early days of the war that it changes certain authorities that he gets uh, in Russia in terms of getting people list, uh, drafted for for uh, as soldiers if they're if it's a war versus if it's an operation something like that maybe I'm completely wrong here and then the second thing that I thought was interesting is that there's some news out news out just as we speak uh, where according to this source, uh, which is a Danish newspaper, that uh, the US is asking Ukraine not to do these deep into Russia uh, military operations where they target oil uh, installations because they're worried that Russia will then retaliate and hit Western oil installations and that's going to drive up the price of of energy uh, considerably. So, all to play for here, I think, uh, in terms of what uh, markets can do uh, as we head into uh, 2024. But I want to take you back to something you kind of mentioned a little bit, but I actually think it's quite interesting. Uh, something that I've uh, been hearing more and more about on a few podcasts that I've been listening to, and that's the whole topic of liquidity. 
And I think I, um, and you know what, I think this is an episode that hasn't come out yet, you know, that we actually have to re-record because the quality wasn't good enough. But anyway, in that conversation, I mentioned something that I had just uh, uh, sort of uh, heard, uh, We or, or that not just I heard, but came out about the change of, of the uh, U.S. balance sheet, uh, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And uh, the idea is here that they have been forced to fund themselves at much, at much shorter duration because last year, essentially, bond markets collapsed uh, when they tried to sell a lot of uh, long-term debt. And uh, I was listening to actually one of our former guests, uh, Michael Howell, who's uh, you know an excellent person when it comes to topics of, of liquidity, and, uh, and his firm, uh, Cross Border Capital, specializes in this. Now, he estimates that the world has to refinance something like $70 trillion every year for the next five years. But at the same time, Janet Yellen has decided to move most of their refinancing, which is not the way it's normally done, but they're mo- she's moving most of the refinancing into the shorter end of the curve. Uh, which, by the way, also means you mentioned the yield curve has been, you know, inverted for the longest time. Well, I think his argument is that it's being artificially inverted because they're restricting the issuance of longer term paper that drives prices up, yields down. So that helps with the inversion, right? But if you look at another yield curve, it, the question is, are you looking at the right yield curve when you say uh, about the inversion? So. I think it's very interesting, and I think obviously uh, closer to your home, what we saw in, it must have been, what, September 2022, when the guild market collapsed due to the fact that uh, List Trust was trying to introduce some uh, unfinanced tax cuts or whatever it was. Essentially, the bond market reacted and basically threw that idea out and her uh, at the same time. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about if you have, followed this a little bit in terms of what you think all of this may lead to, because one of the things that I seem to remember is that a lot of the crisis we end up getting and having, a lot of them is really refinance crisis. I mean, it's to do with not being able to issue debt at levels you expect them to to uh, be accepted by the market. So any have you, is this something you're keeping an eye on? Yeah, I think there's a couple of couple of different points here. Um, I think the first one around Yellen and the U.S. issuance. I mean, I, I have seen people uh, looking at this and saying, basically, it's, you know, it's the Treasury kind of taking control of monetary policy a little bit as well from the perspective of, you know, you're doing quantitative uh, tightening, which should be a force for nudging up long-term bond yields. But then, by tactically, you know, issuing at the short end instead of at the long end, you're 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 basically providing a bit of balance to that and taking some of the pressure off long-term bond yields. Where the whole point of doing that is to, you know, tighten financial conditions gradually. Obviously, you don't want a a a you know a, an exaggerated move at the long end, and maybe that's there was the concern as we were in kind of August last year when ten-year yields in the US hit five percent that it was going to become unruly. So I can see that, but I mean. Yeah, it, it is this issue of kind of fiscal dominance, you know, and who's actually controlling um, uh, monetary policy uh, and, and economic policy. Is, is it more Janet Yellen or is it the Fed? So I think that that's one point. I mean, I, I think in terms of refinancing, I, mean, I don't have the, the stats uh, to hand, but it's certainly something we've talked about before. We talked about it with Chris uh, uh, Christopher Zuck at uh, CAS, come up a number of times. I, I mean, there's a huge amount of refinancing in uh, commercial real estate uh, in the next number of years. Um, and, uh, you know, that's already leading to strains in, in that market. And I think in, in, in certain segments of the, of the corporate bond market, obviously, a lot of this stuff was, uh, you know, uh, refinanced around 2019, 2020 in particular, when rates and yields hit extremely low levels. And very often, it's of a kind of a five-year tenor. So kind of this period of 2024, 25, 26, on that com- commercial real estate and corporate side, that's certainly um, a theme. Now, see, the question is: Is that systemic? I mean, the the, the issue was it was largely U.S. Uh, regional banks um, that 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 were that were uh, going to be impacted for that. I did see actually a story on Bloomberg. Uh, I think it was actually Ontario teachers were selling a building uh, in the U.S. for for a dollar because uh, because it was going to cost them more. 
in terms of refinancing costs and all of that, and, and a refurb was probably needed. Uh, you know, that, so so nobody was going to take it on without to basically getting it for nothing. But that kind of highlights the, the extent of the of the uh, challenges in the commercial real estate market. So I think that's the second stress. I think a third kind of theme here that we might hear a little bit more of is, you know, as these, you know, if if you're doing your issuance at the short end and as interest rates are, are coming up at the short end, you know, there is this, uh, there's the cost for the central bank now of, of paying, paying these higher rates um, on an ongoing basis. And, uh, you know, so we're seeing kind of negative um, losses, basically, at central banks around the world. Now, Strictly speaking, it doesn't matter, you know, and that's always been the theoretical argument. Central banks don't even have to be solvent. They certainly don't have to make money. But, you know, in the kind of populist perspective, you know, when you hear that the central bank is losing money and practically is no longer sending a check to the treasury every year to, to kind of buffer the, the coffers, um, you know, that becomes more of a political issue. So I think certainly central bank uh, mandates could come under stress in relation to that. And, and I think that's another theme related to this whole interest rate readjustment that we're seeing that, that, that we're going to hear more about. All right, let's um, move on in our line of topics. Um, talk a little bit about trend following for a change. So far in March, it's been, you know, not as, not as uh, how should I say, buoyant, as we saw in February. February was pretty extraordinary, but it's still pretty good. Um, solid uh, performance so far, uh, which I'll come to in a second. As far as I can tell, uh, people still enjoying uh, the trend in in cocoa. Uh, that's still in force, very much so. And of course, we have uh, equities as a sector doing really well. And then a few other markets, um, Mexican peso has been uh, pretty good. Maybe some of the trends that we saw early in the year, like short grains and stuff like that, has petered out a little bit. That's probably being replaced to some extent of some long-term uh, biases in uh, in the energy sector. Uh, and I mean the oils, not the gases. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, so far so good. Looking at the numbers, and these are as of Wednesday, uh, because they they are not out just yet for for Thursday night. I think Thursday, by the way, was a good day for trend followers and CTAs. But as of Wednesday night, uh, B Top Fifty was up one and a half percent, up almost seven percent for the year. Uh, Stock Gen CTA index up uh, one and three quarters for the month, up seven point eight percent for the year. Stock Gen Trend Index up one and three quarters as well, up nine point six for the year. And the Short Term Traders Index up about half a percent, up one point one percent for the year. My own trend barometer, by the way, finished yesterday at forty three, um, but it has been up in the fifties um, during the last few days, but has come off a little bit uh, the last uh, two days. Anyways, MSCI World also enjoying a good month so far, up. All almost 3% for the month, up 8.38 for the uh, year. World government bonds, uh, fairly quiet, up 22 basis points in March. And the S&P 500 total return index up almost 3% so far. As of last night, up 10 and a quarter so far this year. Anything um, that you're noticing about uh, CTA trend followers, um, Alan? No, it's been a very good start, obviously, and I mean, I, I guess the noteworthy thing is kind of the the, the kind of the breadth of of uh, trending activity across markets. Obviously, you know, cocoa has been the the headline story in terms of a really exaggerated move, but but equities as well. You know, even you know metals. Obviously, gold has been trending very nicely, um, and some of the other markets, copper, started to move up a little bit as pause, and and as you say. Energies as well for some managers has been been a more important driver. So, you know, as we've been talking about, the it's 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 not a kind of the, the typical kind of crisis alpha risk off type of phase, but it is a period where uh, we're seeing uh, a lot more uh, trending behavior in an environment of, uh, of 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 positive equity return. So, I think that's that that's interesting, and it's probably. You know so the, the the magnitude of some of the, of the of the returns we're seeing across the industry. You know we're seeing like up ten percent in 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 the first uh, two to three months of the year, and and it's kind of like doesn't sound too unusual. If you went back a, a number of years, that would have been a headline that that CTAs are making a comeback. So I think it's just all in the picture of the normalization of 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 the trading environment that we're seeing in the recent years that we're seeing. That's kind of you know, okay, I wouldn't say consistency. The, obviously, the returns are still episodic, but the fact that we're seeing now another burst of positive performance 
is reflecting that environment. Yeah. I don't follow this, but I wonder what the chocolate factories or companies are doing in terms of share price uh, at a time when, I don't know, the price of cocoa has gone up 300% or something like that by now. Anyways, I'm sure someone out there will know and share that uh, with us. All right, you brought along a few topics that we're going to be diving into. Some of them I managed to uh, sort of have a quick look at, but uh, certainly the first one, uh, it was so long that I uh, I gave up. So I'm going to le- let you lead the way. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, the outlook, I think, from the perspective of uh, UBS. Well, it's the outlook and it's the history. I mean, it, this is uh, now the UBS Investment Returns Yearbook. It was historically the Credit Suisse Investment Returns Yearbook, and obviously now UBS and Credit Suisse are one. And this is, as you say, it's a really long document. It's published every year. The, the people behind us, Dimson and Marsh, and there might have been a third person, they wrote a book uh, in 2000 called The Triumph of the Optimists, which looked at long-term um, equity and uh, asset market returns. And ever since then, they've been producing this annual um, reference book. And it really is a great reference book. So if you, if you can get access to it, I'd certainly recommend it. Um, uh, but I just thought worth kind of picking out a few of the, of the interesting insights that come from it. Uh, because, you know, uh, I've often on this podcast talked about, you know, what are the long-term return expectations for the different asset classes? And the last time we were on, we were talking about two different researches, uh, research papers on that. Um, so definitely interesting to get their perspective on that. And also if they have insights as to, you know, what the outlook is going forward. So a few things that, that I picked out, you know, when they look back, they look at, at the... Um, Asset market returns back to 1900, and a pretty pretty comprehensive data set. Now, not all markets were continuous through that whole period, but in the U.S., uh, equities produced 9.6 percent annualized over over that whole period, and that's a six and a half percent real return, which is very much very consistent with the um, uh, Jeremy Siegel's estimate. And and very often that's the number that people think about if you say, well, what's the long term return on equities? You know, six and a half percent real, or maybe nine ten percent nominal. But an important point that they make is that number is very U.S. specific. That if you look at the uh, equity returns around the world, it's not as strong uh, everywhere else. So it's certainly the U.S. is unusual in that respect. Actually, the rest of the world, ex-U.S., annualized 4.3%. So that's actually a pretty meaningful difference uh, be, you know, between the U.S. and the rest. Now, what do you do with that? That's, I guess, an open question. Is that refle- was there going to be reversion to the mean? Or does that just reflect the fact that you know, the U.S. is the most progressive, most open, most capitalistic market uh, that lends itself to, to generating better returns in equity. So that's a call you have to make. But certainly in terms of formulating a return expectation for the very long term, like a pension fund might have to do, probably would be make more sense to be a bit more cautious and, and tilted towards that kind of global return as opposed to taking the U.S. return. Quick question for you here. Do you know, and I could be completely wrong, but is it true? Is it true that the U.S. equity uh, total valuation is something like sixty percent of of global? So that was markets? one of my other insights okay. to share. So, <laughs> ah, sorry. Okay, and the U.S. market is yeah sixty and a half percent of the total world value, which is extremely high. Um, I think it's the highest they've have in the data. The next, like the next biggest, is Japan, six point two percent. Which uh, for a single country, obviously, eurozone was the eurozone, but for a single country, it's Japan. Um, in uh, I think uh, back at the when, uh, at 1990 when Japan was at its peak, it accounted for 40 percent of the total world market. So this is a, a highly unusual that the U.S. is so dominant. Um, if you go back to 1900, the U.S. was 14 and a half percent of the global market, and the U.K. was 24 percent. So the U.K. was the, the biggest trading nation, and you know obviously the reserve cu- currency back then. So. Highly unusual that that the world is so dominated by the U.S. equity market, and of course within the U.S. equity market, dominated by by a, a small few stocks. So um, do they that break is that down? Was do, that, they, do they break that down as well? I haven't. Um, I'm sure it's there somewhere, but I, I, okay. I didn't get it in terms of what those individual stocks are. No, because yeah. a lot of people talk about this concentration risk. We've never seen so much concentration because if 60% of the U.S. market, oh, sorry, if, if the U.S. market is 60% of the world market, we know that, uh, you know, the magnificent seven, six, five, however many there are left, uh, has a very large uh, share of that, which means that you have, you know, a handful of companies 
making up a huge percentage of total global equity capitalization. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, there's different views on that. It, obviously, some people say, well, that's just the nature of how the global economic system has evolved, that you have these big, you know, heavyweights that have built moats, you know, have built these businesses that, that are, are, are going to be around for a long time that are effectively more significant economically than many countries. Um, uh, and that's, you know, so yeah, I, I mean, I mean, mean reversion is a theme that runs throughout their their paper. That, so, I mean, I would have thought that if they were to make a call on that, uh, it would be more likely that that won't be sustained because they also talk about the sectoral composition that how that's shifted over time. So, for example, if you go back to 1900, the, the, the market was dominated by, by the railroads. And uh, in the US, about... Uh, um, you know, eighty percent of the market back then now it doesn't even exist now. We're all kind of these they're Same kind of small with energy, industrial type market. A few so, decades ago, right? Exactly. So obviously, what we spend our money on now is totally different. Obviously, technology is a big, big, big component of of the of the of the index. But that is something that shifts over time, and it naturally kind of uh, evolves. Um, it's kind of I sorry mean, to interrupt you again, Alan. Yeah, but it's kind of interesting as you're you know sharing this insight. Um, I'm thinking of the headlines that I'm seeing at the moment in in, in the papers about uh, you know maybe there is an attempt to break up Apple right <laughs> with all these uh, antitrust uh, lawsuits now being filed in the last couple of days. Um, so yeah, I mean these uh, these leaderships uh, change over time. Who knows? And it reminds me about what happened. I'm sure you remember. Uh, everything that happened with Microsoft and Bill Gates uh, back in whatever it was the '90s with all these antitrust cases. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of the other points that they make. Uh, I mean, it was interesting. You know, we talked about that difference. To, you know, between the the US six and a half percent and and the rest of the world four point three percent. I mean, that doesn't sound that dramatic, but it just to highlight the power of compounding. Uh, you know, the the, the uh, a dollar invested in the US grew to two thousand four hundred and forty three in real terms, whereas at the four point three percent, it only grows to. 191, so less than 8% of the value. And that just shows the power of compounding when, you know, applied to a very long time period. And even like the, you might think the difference between 9.6%, which is the nominal return in the US, and 9.1%, which is the nominal return in the UK over the period. So you say, well, that's about the same, you know, a little bit less, not much. But in terms of compounding over that period, you know, the US a dollar grew to 87,620, where the UK pound grew to 49,404, just driven by that 0.5% uh, difference. Uh, so it does really highlight for, for, for long-term investors eking out those small incremental gains is so massively important when they get compounded over time. Um, of the other important, interesting points from it, I mean, we talk about long-term, uh, and, and, and they make the point that, you know, you really have to take a very long-term, if you're thinking long-term, but you might think 20 years is a long time or 40 years. But as we've said many times before, you know, the last 40 years have been unusually favorable for financial assets, you know, because the starting point was, you know, of, say, Dick, the starting point is 1982, 42 years since then, bond yields were at their peak. So it was a ph phenomenal time. And that's borne out by the data. So they point out that, you know, I, I think in the 40 years to the end of 2021, world bonds generated 6.3% real versus 7.4% for equity. So, okay, granted the what comments we made about compounding, but I mean, not far off for, for a lot less in terms of volatility. But that's an unusual 40-year period. If you go back over the full 100 years, they, they significantly un, un, underperform. So that's an important point to, to highlight again, that, that within that 124 years, you have s smaller periods. Obviously, you know, the last decades, uh, you, uh, um, you know, such as the early 2000s. And, you know, they do highlight the magnitudes of the drawdowns, which are very eye-opening when you look at them again in the US, the largest drawdown in real terms of over 80%. Um, in the UK, not so long, well, I say not so long ago, 50 years ago, 70% drawdown in 1973, 1974. And, and equally, like investors in some countries have lost everything, like Russia and China in 1917 and 1949. Basically, the market disappeared. So... Um, Equities, yeah, the returns are there for the long term, stay, buy and hold, but it's not without risk. And, you know, we, we talk about drawdowns and managed futures and trend following, nothing of that magnitude in terms of 80%. Uh, and interestingly, you know, on the EM theme, you know, actually developed markets have outperformed emerging markets over that period as well. And they have a mechanism of 
you know, characterizing, categorizing emerging markets at that time. So it's like, you know, obviously a market that now is developed was emerging at certain points back then. But it does highlight that, you know, that that risk in emerging markets, the fact that, you know, one or two might go completely bust um, is interesting. They also talk about inflation and, and in the inflation side is interesting as well. You know, to look at the kind of the average inflation rates in Argentina since 1960, inflation has averaged 71.6% on an annual basis. So, I mean, it's not hard to understand why Argentina has, uh, has economic challenges. But interestingly, if you look at the U.S., on average, between 1900 to 2023, inflation is 2.9%. So that's interesting because if somebody was to say, what do you think inflation will be for the next 10 years? I would say, well, probably 3%. And that's obviously we've had periods of lower and higher uh, and, and, and deflation as well in, in that decade. Um, but but interesting. Uh, but, it, but actually, the US is one of the lower countries. If you look at places like France, Spain, Italy, they're all, I think, French inflation has averaged 6.6% over, over that whole period as well. Um, they also point out that, you know, this idea of the, our, our equities and equity hedge, and they kind of were negative on that from the perspective of equities do beat inflation over time. But in the years when you're suffering that high inflation, equities tend to do poorly. So not so much a hedge as more of a, as an asset class that can, over the long term, withstand inflation and do better. But in those years when you tend to have higher inflation, the assets, they highlight the assets that tend to well, obviously commodities and, and gold as well. Um, they also had an interesting uh, uh, section in it on looking at the returns in periods of rising rates and falling rates, uh, which is obviously very topical at the moment. Yeah, and 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 I guess unsurprisingly, you know, uh, equity returns are a lot stronger when equity when rates are rising, and that's even taking the starting point once the rate hike or, or the rate cut has happened. So not taking the, you know account of expectations around that so can, and in the can UK you just actually that, all of them Ellen I just want yeah. to make sure you said it the right way can you just repeat what you said about when equity returns are strongest because sorry strongest when uh, when rates are being cut uh, hopefully exactly uh, so, yeah, yes if I didn't get that right uh, strongest when rates are being cut less uh, when, it, when they're being raised and uh, in the UK actually almost all of the returns you know is, uh, have come when, when rates are being cut I don't know if that'll be the same, if that changes now that everything is so analyzed and people anticipate the rate rise hike or rate cutting cycle, but certainly uh, a, a huge kind of bias uh, in that way. And then finally, just in terms of kind of forward looking expectations to talk about what their estimates are for, for kind of the equity uh, risk premium. And they came down you know, considering a lot of different factors for the world uh, equity risk premium of about three and a half percent over over bills which is less than what it's been historically. Historically, it was about 4.7%. So still, you know, good returns, but but certainly consistent with the idea that valuations are certainly on the higher side, not saying necessarily a bubble, but certainly on the higher side and, and return expectations should be accordingly lower looking forward. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating uh, that's a fascinating piece of uh, information, I have to say. I, I really appreciate you sharing uh, some of these uh, highlights because it is actually quite a long uh, piece of uh, research and uh, and it's interesting that they have all that historical data I think so um, I mean based on what we've just talked about you would think that you should put all your money in equities <laughs> to some extent so I'm kind of thinking you may have something up your sleeve to that uh, to that uh, point that's right so that was the perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about next which was uh the obvious implication is you just put all your money in equities and you ride out the volatility. And that's indeed what uh, some researchers uh, in the US were highlighting recently, which um, prompted Cliff Asnes at AQR to, to write a, a blog piece about. And uh, so basically it was uh, an academic piece done on looking at, you know, obviously a lot of money is managed according to uh, kind of target date type mandates, you know, so you where, where the asset allocation is set according to your age. So if you're far from retirement, your portfolio will have more equities. And if you're getting closer to retirement, more bonds. And this study um, kind of questioned whether that was actually the, the right method. And they were saying actually an equity all, an all equity portfolio, if you diversify globally, did just as, did better, obviously. Uh, admittedly, it, it probably had higher uh, drawdowns. And then Cliff Asmus, um was, I mean, his point is is so. So the question is: Should investors be one hundred percent equity? It's like so. Yeah, it's it, it is a, a valid question. Like, it, and a lot of people would say yes. You know, just be one hundred percent equities because that's what the 
equities have historically been the asset class with the highest returns. Uh, but I suppose the point is, yes, they are the one with the highest returns, but they're also maybe the highest risk. And it depends how you measure risk. Is it volatility or not, or drawdown or, or, or what? And I suppose the point is he's making, it's no surprise that the asset with the highest expected return has had the highest realized return. Um, I guess more generally, he makes the point about uh, that, it, that if you're, I guess certainly if you're an institutional investor, actually you, you can make a case very easily for not being 100% equities because as you know, and as we know, if you combine equities with something that's uncorrelated, you can generate a, a, a higher sharp ratio. Um, you know, so whether that's a 60, 40 portfolio or whether, or maybe equities plus trend following or something like that. And then what you can do is lever that portfolio up to the same volatility as equities, and you'd actually get a higher return. So, so in that instance, what he points out is, I suppose this is one of the basic tenets of uh, modern portfolio theory that, you know, what you should do is, is formulate the best sharp maximizing or the best, most robust portfolio. Uh, that's most diversified, etc. And then the si- and the second question is, well, how much of that portfolio do you want to hold in risk terms and lever it up or down according to your risk profile? Whereas, kind of what you tend to find in the asset management industry and the wealth management industries is, if you want to take more risk, get more equities. If you want to take less risk, it's less equities. In actual fact, it should be a diversified portfolio levered up or down. Now, you might say, well. A lot of investors can't get the leverage, and that's and that's a valid point. Like, if you want to lever up a portfolio, the obvious way to do it would be to rather than buying the S and P five hundred ETFs, you would buy the S and P five hundred futures, and then you'd have some spare cash that you could go and 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 invest elsewhere. So that's the whole idea of capital efficiency, what people are now calling return stacking, etc. And that that that's that's a valid way of doing it. Now, a lot of people will say. Um, Oh, you know, I don't know in the bed trading futures, you know, how, how do I do it? And I, so I think this is where it gets interesting and, and maybe links to, um, you know, to, to, to kind of some of the issues around trend following and manager selection. And actually, one way you can get that leverage or build more leverage into your portfolio is when you're selecting your alternative strategies or your diversifying strategies is to allocate to the more higher vol strategies because and the higher vol managers within those categories because you're basically getting the leverage from that manager. So you don't have to go lever up your portfolio. You're basically allocating to a manager who is doing that for you, and that creates the capital efficiency. And that's something that, you know, um, you know, I looked at some stats around this. You know, so, you know, if you, for example, if you just invested between equities and the stock gen trend index, 80, 20, yes, it improves your, 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 your return, it improves your drawdown. But if you go and invest in, in, in equities plus a one and a half time levered version of the subchain trend, you get a much higher return and you still get the benefits on the drawdown, et cetera. Um, so it's something that, you know, it's one of these kind of issues that I think um, it's interesting. I talked to with Peter Madsen, the, one of the allocators recently. It's like the dis- disconnect between what makes sense from a pure uh, portfolio perspective, you know, selecting uncorrelated assets but trying to get as much volatility from them as possible. The reality is people don't do that. Why is that? I think it's like things like career risk. It's not wanting to fail, you know, unconventionally. It's, um, you know, the line looking at the portfolio on a line item basis rather than saying we're getting this capital efficiency from the high vol strategy. Uh, instead to say, oh, we're getting this massive drawdown here at, at this point in time and, and forgetting that they're making money on the equity side at the same time. So he raises a, a good point. Yeah, just because equities in uh, have the highest um, kind of historic return doesn't mean it's 100% equities. There are things you can do. Obviously, leveraging your portfolio is the obvious way to kind of balance that off. But there are other kind of practical techniques that even the kind of an investor who is limited to investing in funds and can't lever, they can actually achieve much the same of that leverage by by actually finding high vol strategies that are uncorrelated with equities. And obviously trend following is one of those. And it does kind of highlight the the, the benefit of within the trend space of, of, of selecting managers who do run at a reasonable level of volatility. I completely agree with all of these uh, points. 
and uh, and also the reasoning why uh, you mentioned that um, investors and in this case institutional investors are uh, way under allocated really to alternatives and certainly to trend following we know that uh, for sure but when I hear the reasoning and as much as I agree with them you would think well people who work as PMs or CIOs or sits on an investment committee at a big institution they're all very well educated they know all this right they know not to look at line items they know it's about what the portfolio improvement is and they also know not to look at a sharp ratio on a single item because sharp was not uh, invented for that frankly so why do you think they still don't do what they should that i don't understand i i don't agree that they all necessarily know i mean i i think there are if you look at kind of the multi-asset space very often people come from a fixed income background or an equity background and people are always kind of comfortable with what they know um and um so you know i think there i think there is a an element of um lack of knowledge around maybe some trading strategies yeah i think the behavioral biases are you know the career risk is certainly part of the story but but it is an interesting question i mean i i i, may, I do make that point when um the simple maps show the benefit but yet wh- wh- why are, are so many people under allocated to it so, so i think it's a combination of reasons it reminds me of certainly one investor famous investor who probably knew that the evidence was suggesting that diversification is a good thing but clearly he didn't want to embrace diversification. And that's Charlie Munger. I think he was out always saying that, you know, the trade-off between safety and return, et cetera, et cetera, that he just didn't believe it in and you should just stay fully invested uh, in equity. So, uh, yeah. Now, we've talked a little bit about sort of the challenges that um, some of these uh, portfolios have and how they uh, should embrace alternatives. So why don't we dial, uh, dive into another paper you found, which kind of highlights the issue, because if you if you have decided that you want to diversify, if you have decided that, yeah, probably in the world of hedge funds, somewhere there should be something that uh, would work well for you, you need to kind of have a framework for picking, well, which hedge funds and what's their role in this portfolio and so on and so forth. And uh, you found a paper on that topic. So why don't you uh, share what you found? Yeah, I, I came across this paper from uh, Wellington, um, obviously a big US asset manager. And uh, I mean, it's it's not a, a very um, scientific or uh, detailed paper. It's more of a, um, an a educational... It's a good reminder uh, of a few yeah, basic yeah, things. Yeah, more of an yeah. educational piece. But but I, di- I did think it, it had a, an important message in there but equally uh, raise some other points as well. And it's about can a hedge funds play play the role is what it's called. And I think I think where it, what it's good is that, you know, very often you hear these very broad brush statements like, oh, well, maybe you should allocate 5% to hedge funds or 10% to hedge funds. But I mean, that's obviously nearly a meaningless uh, comment from the perspective of there are so many different strategies. And they point that out, that, I mean, there's make the, I suppose, point that... Uh, yeah, you know, when investors are constructing portfolios, they're typically looking for um, either return consistency or return enhancement or diversification or, or downside protection. So when you're looking at the various building blocks, you got to think about well, which strategies can help uh, help you achieve it. So they kind of start off from the perspective of if you take a, a an equity portfolio or a fixed income portfolio or a 60-40 portfolio, you know, which of those is that good at and, and then where are the gaps? And obviously, I guess with a 60, portfo- 60 40 portfolio, you've got your equities for growth, you've got your bonds for diversification and for, 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 for downside protection and maybe for consistency. Obviously, we know there are issues with that, that that's not a given as well because that, that, that only works in a kind of a, in a growth shock environment, in an inflation or supply shock environment. Your fixed income is challenged as well. But then the question is, well, okay, if you're going to look at strategies like uh, equity long short, event driven, macro relative value, you know, where do all of these fit in? So I thought that was it was good in the sense of highlighting that don't put your equity long short into your diversifiers. It sounds pretty straightforward, but you know, I have seen it in multiple uh, asset allocation plans, like five percent of hedge funds, and within that, you know, market neutral and long short and. And I mean, some, sometimes that's behavioral because 
it's managed as an old portfolio and they want to have kind of a reasonably consistent return within that. So that's fair enough. But in t- I think in terms of managing from the overall portfolio perspective, that, that doesn't make sense that, that anything that's equity biased should be in the, in the equity bucket. And things like obviously um, macro, and they don't specifically talk about trend following or managed features, but that is in the broad macro category. I mean, historically, that would, would be in, uh, I guess, the downside protection and the uh, diversification. But, you know, as we're seeing in the current environment, um, you know, and a conversation I was having with one allocator in the, the, that'll be coming out soon in the allocator, you know, they could e- equally be seen as return generators now. You know, go back five years, it was harder to make convince people of that, but we always knew that in an environment where you get strong trends in, in a pro-risk environment, it, it can contribute uh, uh, as strongly. So I think... Um, I have one question I, for I you, think, actually, uh, as yeah. you go through these strategies. And I think they raised the point, but I actually didn't have... I didn't read the, the answer they, that they wrote. Um, but it's something that I come across a lot because they are so popular at the moment. And that's these multi-strat funds that, you know, where where do they fit in in all of this? Uh, can you even categorize them, except maybe for return consistency, I guess? Yeah, I think it's a good point. And it's something I, I think about too, and I get asked by investors the same question. Um, and I, I suppose that there is this general question that if something kind of fulfills a couple of different mandates, then, then how does that play out? Or is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, I suppose you could ask the question, are they more growth or defensive? Or could you construct a portfolio of, say, a growth asset and have some diversifying strategies with that? Would that do as well as a multi-strat? Probably, I would guess. You know, so the question then is of having this multi-strat that has, the, you know, growth and some consistency. Well, that's good. Um, but it, it, are you going to have the downside protection <coughs> from, from, from those kind of multi-strat products? I think that's somewhat questionable. Like, obviously, I think my, my my sense is a lot of those strategies did reasonably well in 2022. But actually, if you go back to Q1 2020, a number of these types of strategies got stressed during the, the you know, the basis trade uh, issue in, in March 2020. So are they really, you know, a strategy that, that are going to be bomb-proof in that type of scenario? I'm not sure. So I certainly wouldn't be holding a lot of that multi-strat type um uh, exposure in, in the kind of the downside protection bucket. That's not to say there's no role for it, but I think it would be more tilted towards your your uh, return enhancement uh, element. Um, I think as well, like, all uh, the, the, what they've done here well is, as highlight the general point, I suppose what, what they haven't talked about at all is, is what we were talking a little bit earlier is things like sizing, you know, and how much, you know, what we tend to see is maybe the, you know, as, you know, the 5% allocation, the trend following you know, why isn't it much higher? You know, so they don't bring in the, the, the discussion around what level of volatility, how much leverage. I think these are all kind of the, the next level up in terms of, of, of constructing uh, a good portfolio as well. And then I think as well, you know, arguably you could probably be more dynamic in, in allocating across the strategies as well from the perspective of, you know, if volatility is unusually low, there might be a case for, for tail risk protection type strategies. Whereas if it's higher, you know, the, the, the hurdle is, is going to be greater. You know, if interest rates are higher, you get a higher return in trend following and managed futures. So that can be an additional reason for putting it in, in, in the return chain generating. So I think there are kind of tactical tilts you can make depending on the macro environment. Uh, but I thought this was a good starting point, but it's kind of like uh, maybe building a, a liquid oils portfolio. 101 or 201 it's not, not it's a bit better than than you see in a lot of places but there's a lot more to think about than just the, the, i suppose the role of of each of the strategies i mean unfortunately i forget i forget the name of uh, this uh, hedge fund manager um based in spain i think uh, well known it just escapes my my brain right now but i remember that he's written and talked a lot about this idea of of different strategies uh, from the perspective of if you're constructing a a Euro, you know and I'm a soccer team or a football team as we would say um, I'm sure you know who I'm thinking about and 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 how the various strategies would fit a place on on the pitch and, and so on and so forth and I think sometimes these analogies can be helpful for people to understand the, the benefits uh, and the purpose and, and the role, as they say. In, in Wait, is it uh, Diego? Is it it um, was Diego, yeah. You're absolutely yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, and um, so, yeah, we should uh, we should come up with more uh, analogies. Yeah, I mean, I think what, I mean, what would the rugby analogy be? <laughs> That's a really good question. Yeah, um, <laughs> they're all I in the scrum know. somewhere. You know, I know. yes, uh, good, good. I'll have to I'll have to think about that. You put me on a spot. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I mean, it's interesting. You talk about Diego, and I mean, we've had this uh, David Dredge as well, yeah. the goalkeeper type analogy for for the tail risk protection. Do you need the midfielders? As I, 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 and I suppose the point is. You have different strategies that can play multiple roles, but still you'll have debates uh, among asset allocators and uh, about what how to use them. And I think that de- depends on, you know, if you're a long-term compounder or if you actually want a bit more consistency in return generating. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, you know, consistency, it's all about staying the course, managing the vol. But actually, you know, we often forget that that actually for a lot of investors, because of their behavioral because of their makeup, they actually like consistency and performance. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just constructing a portfolio that uh, that best suits the, the the investors' needs. So I think that's the important an important takeaway as well. Yeah, yeah. But at least we have seen some developments in in our space, I guess, uh, from people who have, as you said, uh, stacked returns together. It's nothing new. It just came back uh, a few years ago uh, to the forefront, and uh, and now there are products out there that kind of. Does the work for 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 investors where they can just choose one ticker and they get uh, the benefits of putting at least a, a couple of uh, non correlated return streams together and and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, at the end of the day, if more investors would invest like that um, in the long run, that should be uh, that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the challenge is that by doing that, you're you're using um, futures markets, you're using leverage derivatives and these are all you know kind of highly charged uh, expressions you know the i think like even buffett has called derivatives weapons of mass disruption you know so when somebody is as as while you know, uh, he's using them himself to a high yeah, degree exactly. which yeah. is kind of funny yeah so it's always a matter of how they're used you know um and and in, in one context but um absolutely you know i think this idea that the pie is only 100 uh, percent and it doesn't make sense to ever beyond that uh, uh, is is not correct, but it's but you have to know what you're doing. Um, I think that's the other point. It's not something uh, you know. The, the the risk is you lever up. You have a lot of the same exposures in your portfolio, and you lever that up, and that's where you run into problems. I, Obviously, the benefit of combining trend to following, say, with equities or bonds or whatever, is they're naturally uncorrelated. I can think of a few pension funds that have come up pu- publicly and said, "Oh, we're just going we're going to lever up uh, our portfolio." Uh, one of them being the largest Danish pension fund a couple of years back, and they managed to lose 50% of their reserves in one year, namely 2022. And then when the bounce back came last year, they only made like 5 or 10%, you know. So clearly they could have used a little bit of a, a, a few other types of players on, on their team. <laughs> uh, anyways, Alan, as usual, fun, insightful, um, great stuff. Anything else you want to bring up as we wrap up anything that uh, we you've been inspired to um to share before we we tried to think was there anything that we didn't get to speak about um i think we followed the the outline pretty yeah, well I think but so. there could have been yeah. something else that came to mind as we were talking no, I think that was it. Okay, good stuff. All right, well, um, with that, Alan and I are going to wrap up. As usual, uh, we would be so grateful if you would go to your favorite podcast platform and um, share rating and review. It really does uh, help us um, become more visible to uh, more podcast listeners, so we would appreciate that. Also, as usual, you can send questions for us uh, to info at toptradersonplug.com. Um, the next guest uh, or co-host uh, will be Mark. Uh, as as you know, Mark has decades of experience in this industry, so if you want to throw some challenging questions at him, um, then um, now is the time, and uh, the sooner I get them, the better than I can organize my line-out for, um, for next week. In any event, uh, from Alan and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We certainly look forward to being back with you next week, and in the meantime, as usual, Take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. 
We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.